Hi and welcome back to the channel. I'm Andy at Express IT Tech Tips and this is the first part of the Home Lab series. Now I went and bought a Lenovo P700 to solve a challenge I was having where my old Dell, which was an R7200 XD, was well too loud for this room. To the point of when I've been trying to record YouTube videos, all I could hear and a lot of the noise suppression I've had to put on the mic has made this really challenging for me. So I decided to go out and change from a enterprise grade server back to a Lenovo P700 workstation. And I wanted to take you on that journey. Now, a couple of things you will need. One is a USB stick with Proxmox installed. Now, if you haven't already, go and watch the video that I made on Ventoy, because that will make this journey a lot simpler. The video should appear for you now. What you then need to do is make sure you've got the very latest version of Proxmox ISO. I will also put a link in the description to pick up that. Without further ado, just a little bit of an introduction of the device, and then we'll go on to the installation. So with my home lab setup, this is the device I'm using. This is a Lenovo P700, and you may notice I've already swapped out the DVD drive. You've got four USBs on the front, which are USB free. On the rear, you've got the standard stuff that you would see on a, an older PC, like the audio and PS2 jacks, two Ethernet ports, four standard USB 2s, four USB 3s. In this, I've got a GTX 750 Ti and a spare blanking plate, which is amazing. Now, the good thing about the Lenovo P700 is it is completely toolless. Now, to remove the side, it's just a case of pulling up the latch and pulling it towards you and then sliding off the side panel. And pretty much everything that's marked with a red banner is where you remove the device, apart from the red, red SATA cable I've since installed. So just ignore that. But yeah, just lifting the, sh the airflow shroud, you've got simple access to where the memory seated. The power supply can be removed. That's a simple in and out job. Similar with the drives, they're basically sitting in these four port or four bays. Now the DVD drive works slightly different. I'll just remove the SATA cables I'd previously installed, but you just pull down these two clips and then you can rotate any device out. So this is a, an external drive bay I've installed and then twist it out. Now when I bought this off eBay I was promised it came with 16 gig of RAM. Now just looking at it you can probably see there is only three sticks which are four gig each making a total of 12. So the seller couldn't count or misplaced one. Either way I've got a nice reduction on it so they knocked off 40 quid for just missing 4 gig, which I thought was a bit of a Brucey bonus. But yeah, it's a really good device. Really useful for home lab. It's got fairly low power usage. It's about 120 watts max from what I've seen. And it idles around 80, which is a lot better than my server was. Now, I did buy some additional memory. And again, I bought this off a separate seller who didn't decide an anti-static bag was worth it and just wrapped these 16 gig sticks in bubble wrap. So you'll notice I don't discharge myself against the case. I kind of thought at this point, well, they're most likely shagged anyway. So yeah, fair enough. They weren't, which is good. But what I will do is reuse at least two of these four gig sticks as well, just to give me a little bit of additional memory. So I'll just remove these three. Now they do have coded dim slockets, these. So the, the white ones are the ones you need to populate first. And what they do is they share across the two CPUs. So the idea is to match across. So I'll just remove the current ones. And then we'll look in installing the new 16 gig. So I'm going to run these across these two channels which are the first two to propagate and then the additional memory will fall onto the others as so 
Now, when it comes to putting the device back together, it's just a simple case of reversing the procedure. So just aligning the clips, pushing that in, putting this in the correct way round, reattaching all the SATA cables, adding on the shroud, and then finally just the outside case. Really simple. It's great when they're tallest because you don't need to rely on screwdrivers. I did break the catch on doing this. And next we'll look at how to install Proxmox. Hi, right, welcome back. Can you believe that seller only sent me 12 gig and tried to tell me it was 16? It's one of those things, I guess, but never mind. I got a decent rebate and therefore I'll reinvest it and get some more memory. I will stick the full specs in the chart below, but we'll carry on now with the Proxmox install. You will, as I mentioned at the start of the video, now need your stick with Ventoy installed. If you haven't already, go and watch the video. So with the Lenovo, you just press enter to get into the BIOS. I'm just gonna fly through and change some of the settings to make sure VTD is enabled and also make sure I'm selecting the correct boot device. So I'll just fly through this rather than show every individual setting because it will vary on model. So, you know, if you do buy a P700, I can quite happily help you with the guide on that. But uh, apart from that, it will it will vary depending on your make and model. So when we boot in second time round, I will now select a temporary drive and you'll notice I'm booting up in legacy. Now that's by design. That's so I'm using Grub rather than... Um, having to use a kernel version. Now on my Ventoy stick, I've already preloaded the latest Proxmox, which I just click on the ISO and off it goes. Simple case of selecting install. And it will kick in in a moment. Now I have sped up parts of this video, not all of them. I just wanted to be able to show this in a, in a reasonable fashion because if we, we sat and spoke for the whole part of this it, we would be here quite a while so certain elements of this have been sped up certain haven't um, one, you, one thing you'll be needing to clearly do is to make sure that you've got a target device in mind for this as part of this process so as it boots into Proxmox it is quite nice because it's got a nice little GUI to help you now there are some interesting end user agreements that you can read or you can do what most of us do and just click OK. Now in the bottom here you'll notice all my disk and I will select my 500 gig SSD. Just if you've got a network connected it will most likely pick this up for you, however you can enter it yourself. Here you need to select a root password and confirm. And then finally, an email address. Now, you have to put something that is a valid email address. Now, that doesn't mean it needs to be a working email address. So I use Proxmox at Gmail. And again, if you've got DHCP enabled, it should be able to pick up an IP address. But you'll need to propagate a host name in the correct FQDN format. And we just click Next and it will go off and install. And again, like I said, I have sped this part up quite considerably just because depending on the speed of the machine you're using and what you're writing to and from will vary difference on your mileage. However, primarily, it doesn't take particularly long. I think it took about two minutes for me to install this. Now once you're done, it will prompt to restart, which it's doing now. And what it will finally do is give you a URL to access. And it usually ends with the port 8006. So we'll just let the device restart. I deliberately didn't speed this bit up just so that you get a view of how long it takes to boot up first time round. Primarily, I have to reboot this a fair few times as part of some of the other work I'll be doing in other parts of the guide. 
So I'm quite used to rebooting it. And to be honest, it kind of does it very quickly. You don't notice it half the time. And there we are. We're at the point of a login. So there, all I need to go is to 192.168.32.22. Two or two two three. I may have changed it for a point in this video. Log in with your root and password. You'll notice it comes up with an. You don't have a valid subscription. Now don't worry about that. You don't particularly need one. There are ways to add yourself to a special group that enables you to pull down updates. They are kind of test updates. They're community ones. However, I've never had any challenge with it, with them. Now, I will, again, put this into the description so that you've got it available to you. But basically, they all need to be dropped into there. And then the final thing is to comment out the correct distribution group from the enterprise list, which I'll just, again, copy and paste that in. And I will include these commands in the description for you. So just comment that by putting a hash and then control X to save and out we come. Last part is to run the update. So this will basically pull down all of the recent Debian updates. And then we do an upgrade. And again, I have sped this part up. This one can take at least two or three minutes as a general rule, particularly first time you do it. And it's just finalizing. And what we'll now do is a distribution upgrade, which does the kernel. And that's just dist upgrade or update or upgrade. Finally do a yes. And when that is complete, we will reboot. And that's fundamentally enough to get you started with Proxmox. So this gives you all the updates, it gives you the ability to update the system when a new kernel is updated or new templates, etc., or other elements of Proxmox are updated. So the repository for pulling down these updates gives you, you know, very good stable security updates as well. So you kind of de-risk yourselves from some of the challenges by not having these. And we're nearly there. So it's just a simple case now of inserting the command reboot now. And that will reboot the host. And then we'll pick the rest up in part two. So welcome back and we've reached the end of the video. Now in this video, you should have picked up a little bit about the P700, why I chose it. Primarily it was because it's got dual CPUs, which are both Xeon processors, plenty of space and room for memory upgrades and decent storage. Now, I think one of the biggest things was around power consumption and noise levels, which that's massively addressed a challenge I had with the enterprise grade server. And then what we covered off is how to install Proxmox. And now that installation process should work for any device. There are certain parts in your BIOS that you'll need to set up. And I mentioned that earlier in the video. And the next part, part two, will cover off a little bit more about Proxmox and, and the end eventualities of what we want to achieve. And in that, we'll cover off LXC containers, VMs, storage mapping, and PCI pass-through. Now, in the very next one in particular, I'll cover off Pi Hole in an LXC container, True NAS installation, because that's what I'll use for my NAS, and Docker, Compose, and Portainer. Very, very important tools because they open up the world to plenty of opportunities. So hopefully you've learned a little bit today. It is sitting there nicely now in my background. You can probably just see the lights sitting there. 
I can't hear it, which is fantastic. You know, that's that's what I wanted to achieve. And my energy bill looks like it's come down a little bit in the last couple of days. So, you know, fingers crossed. Everything's working well. So stay tuned for part two. That will be coming very shortly. Cheers for now.